Welcome, welcome back to church family. Hopefully everybody is getting settled in and said their eyes, hello. Oh my goodness, so good to see you again. And get ready for worship this morning as we get ready to um, prepare for our service this morning. We're going to open up with our first song. Please join us uh, as a prelude as we get uh, prepared for worship. Hosanna, please join us. So for those ladies that came this morning at 9, you can come next week at 9. That would be perfect timing. <laughs> and then we also have and celebrate on the month of April the Annie Armstrong Easter Offering Month. Um, so enclosed in your bulletin, you should have received um, one of these. And so it gives you information. Um, about the Annie Armstrong, and there's also the prayer schedule from the days. So um, what we normally do is take it out every day and pray upon that one prayer request for each week. Um, if you would like to donate towards our mission there, um, we do have special envelopes located at the back where Auntie Debbie and Auntie Susie are, um, that you can um, go ahead and put your donations there. We also have child care um, available for our children, um, ages 
three to about fourth grade um, that is available during our services. Um, and we would like them to stay though for the worship part of the music. And then once the message um, is ready to be given, then we'll have them um, go off with our, um, our uh, ministry of people that will take care of the um, children throughout that time, okay? Um, we also have the hospitality committee meeting after worship service today, and that'll be located in the room on your right. Um, we do have children's Sunday school via Zoom that will be canceled until further notice, and that's because we have um, the live Sunday school here at the church. Um, we also have a Bloom Brunch for Christian women that's being held on Saturday, April 22nd. Um, in the bulletin, it says 23rd. That's actually our dedication the following day for our church. But on the 22nd, um, New Hope Kilo is actually hosting their first um, Bloom Brunch. And I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it's a pretty popular thing in Hawaii, but it's for women. Um, to celebrate Christian um, leadership um, within their church and just a time to fellowship for all Christian women. So um, if you are interested, you can go ahead and um, register online and the website is there, ilovebloom.com, or you can contact me um, if you are interested and my phone number is there. Also, for those that um, are wanting to go and say, you know, it's $45 to go, but um, if you would like to be sponsored for the program, please DM me or message me on my phone and just let me know that you would like to be sponsored or if you have someone that you would like to bring with you and you would like that person to be sponsored, please text me as well, okay? Because we want all the women to go. We're hoping that we can get a group of us going um, from our church and representing our church at New Hope. Uh, we also have our church building dedication that will be held during worship service beginning at 1015 on the 23rd. And there will be no Sunday school um, for the fellowship gathering in the pavilion. Um, we'll do after the service. We'll be providing light refreshments, poo-poos, and beverages. So the hospitality committee has a sign-up sheet for potluck items in the back of the sanctuary. So if you would like to um, bring something light, then you can go ahead and fill that out. Our next general membership meeting is scheduled for April 30th after our worship service. And if you are a first um, time visitor here or returning visitor, uh, we would like you to go ahead and complete a welcome form which is provided in the back as well. I have one prayer request that we would like to bring up. Majority of our, or I think all of our prayer requests um, are actually listed in the weekly Friday update, which is emailed um, to any interested members of our church, um, which is at the bottom of your bulletin. But we have one specific prayer request um, that I would like to have Lisa go ahead and announce. Oh, yes. Good morning. Um, a lot of announcements, but all in the name of the Lord. Um, on that last one, and this is just continued prayers for many things in our church, um, within a few days of the ministry, I'm just going to read it, learning of an opportunity to purchase updated sound equipment to improve our worship service experience. Uh, we currently have announced the, uh, currently have 2,200, uh, leaving uh, 1,550 uh, to go, so just keep that in prayer for a new soundboard. As you can see, the team is expanding, and a lot of things um, that's in need, uh, we're kind of playing around with this board, and we're trying to pull cords out to plug cords in and so forth. So uh, we made it work the last couple of years, and uh, I think it's time for us to pray for God's continuous guidance to uh, move forward and provide um, what's much needed. So please, uh, on that last prayer request, if you can just, if you have any questions, feel free to partner up with me after service today. Thank you. All right, with that, we'll um, go ahead and begin our Annie Armstrong Easter offering. Thank you, Claire. Good morning. 
and I will be kicking off the Annie Armstrong um, Easter offering. And uh, the ladies here, the missions ladies here at YKR Baptist Bible Church do three offerings a year. The first one is Annie Armstrong. And uh, this is to fund missions in North America. And in September, we do Sumi Shikawa to benefit Hawaii Pacific region and then Lani at the end of the year for international missions. Uh, the Annie Armstrong Easter Offering was uh, started way back in 1895 by the Women's Missionary Union, and this was to benefit work of the North American Mission Board. Then, in 1934, it was named after Lottie Moon, who was a bold missions advocate and Women's Missionary Union first national executive leader. Annie Armstrong lived from 1850 to 1938. She championed mission support among Southern Baptist churches and, and inspired people to God's call to pray, to give, and to go. So today, um, more than $2 billion have been donated by Southern Baptist churches and individuals to support the thousands of missionaries and uh, in church plantings and compassion ministries. Because of this giving, millions of lives have uh, been transformed by the power of the gospel. So with your partnership, the North American Missions Board is committed to taking this hope to cities, uh, small towns, and to college campuses. The Annie Armstrong Easter Offering is the primary way Southern Baptists fund missions in North America. And uh, it helps support more than 2,400 missionaries um, serving across the United States, uh, which in the North American region, it also includes Canada and U.S. territories of Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, Guam, and American Samoa. So this year's theme, if you notice on your uh, brochure, is called United Called to One. So again, if you would like to make a contribution, there are special envelopes um, on the back table, or you can just write a check. And in the memo line, um, write Annie Armstrong in the memo line. Claire, if you write a check, we send it out to the Waikouka Bible Baptist. Waikouka Baptist Church. W U B C. Yep, yeah. W U B. Same thing as you do with your offerings. Oh. And. Uh, and then next week, Sandy Patterson will share more information on the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. So right now, we'll watch a really quick video clip on the uh, kickoff for the Annie Armstrong Christians offering. Thank you. They see him here. They see him here. And they see him here. We know it because he said it. Jesus said, the world will see him when the world sees us. That's why, together, we do this. We give so that those who've not yet seen can see. It means something when the world sees how we give. It means something because we do not look the same. It means something because we do not sound the same. It means something because when we give, this is what the world sees. They see the gospel doing what the world cannot. They see the gospel making us one. And so, we give. We give so that missionaries can go. We give so that churches can be started, hurts can be healed, and truth can be shared. We give so the world might see Jesus in us. United, United as one.
which is taken from 2 Corinthians, chapter 7, verses 8 to 10. Only two, so not too much longer to stand, okay? <laughs> so again, I'll begin with the even, and you will do the odd. Even if I cause you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I am happy, not because your sorrow led you to repentance, for you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. May God bless his word. You may be seated. Before we say the scriptures, let's pause for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, again, we're grateful for every moment that we have to live for you. And these moments are here to hear your word. We ask that you help us to read the scripture and hear it and understand it and later apply it to our lives. And thank you for allowing me to bring the message this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, on New Year's Day, 1929, oh, I, I, I forgot, I can't, I can't walk. <laughs> I, mean, I just have to walk, you know. <laughs> I can't walk this morning. Okay. Well, on, on New Year's Day, uh, 1929, the University of California played Georgia Tech in the Rose Bowl football game in Pasadena, California. And that game has forever been immortalized because during the game, one Ron Regals of the University of California picked up a Georgia Tech fumble and ran 69 yards in the wrong direction towards the wrong goal line. And that boo-boo is still considered the greatest boo-boo in football, college football history. And people still remember him as wrong way regals. We know the Bible teaches that we all sin, we all make errors, and every time we sin, we are really running in the wrong direction away from God. We need to stop, change directions, and run towards Jesus. And this morning, we're going to study about a man who recognizes sin, but couldn't, in his pride, turn, return to God. He kept on going in the wrong direction. So please return with me to our text. It's going to be on the screen. Our text this morning is from Matthew chapter 27, verses 1 to 5. We're going to study about the man who just couldn't turn to Jesus. Matthew 27, verse 1. Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people came to the decision to put Jesus to death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the thirty silver coins to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us, they replied, that your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. Well, let me just briefly reconstruct the setting of this passage. This is the morning of the day that Jesus is going to be crucified. The evening before, he had shared the Last Supper with his closest disciples, the Twelve Apostles. And then he shared with them what we can learn from the Gospel according to John, chapters 14, 15, 16, and 17. And in those chapters, what he shared with them was that if they believed in him, they would be assured to be in heaven with him. And then he also gave them the responsibility that they had to remain in him, to abide in him. And then he promised to give them his Holy Spirit to empower them as they lived the Christian life. That was his promise to them. And then he went off uh, with his disciples 
to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And before, and before, before he went up to pray, he also told them that he prayed for himself, prayed for his disciples, and then he prayed for all the future Christians like you and I. And then he went off to the garden to pray. And it was there in the Garden of Gethsemane that Judas led the Roman authorities and the Jewish religious leaders to arrest Jesus. He was then led to be questioned by the Jewish religious leaders. So coming to the conclusion of our introduction, let's look at our text this morning, verse 1, where they all agreed that Jesus had to die. Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people came to the decision to put Jesus to death. Now the phrase, all the chief priests and elders of people, refer to the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin would be, in the United States, a comparison would be combined the U.S. Supreme Court with the House of Representatives and the Senate all put into one. And so they had this tremendous by the most influential group in all of Israel. And so they decided very early in the morning that Jesus had to die. And then verse 2, they bound him, led him away, and handed him, hand him over to Pilate, the governor. See, Jesus was not tried by the Jewish religious leaders. They had no power. See, when the Romans conquered Israel, they took away most of the power of the Sanhedrin. And so all they could do was question Jesus, bring up false charges against him, and then bring him to the Romans to try him and then to execute him. And then so what they did, they tied up Jesus, bound him, and took him to Pilate, the Roman governor. And who was this Pilate? Roman historians tell us his name was Pontius Pilate. He was appointed the governor of Judea, a Roman province by this time, Roman province of Judea, in AD 26, and he was removed in AD 37. Um, he was strongly anti-Jewish, and uh, he was a very poor ruler. Now, from the other Gospels, we learned that at first, when Jesus was brought before Pilate, he said, this guy is guilty of nothing, he's totally innocent. But then he heard that Pilate, um, Jesus, excuse me, that Jesus was from Galilee, and he, so he said, hey, I'm going to send Jesus to this guy, just um, Herod Antipas, who was the king, you might say, of, at the, under the rule, the Romans, of course, of, the, of Galilee, and he was in Jerusalem to celebrate the Jewish Passover. And, and Herod Antipas was not truly Jewish. He was just half Jewish, but he was more like a Gentile than a Jew. And so Herod just made fun of Jesus, and then sent Jesus, Jesus right back to Pilate. And the second time, Pilate found Jesus guilty of treason against the Roman government and sentenced him to die. He still felt Jesus was totally innocent, but because he was afraid of the Jewish mobs, he sentenced Jesus to be crucified. And so let's study now the main emphasis of the sermon from verses 3 to 5. All the Gospels tell us that Judas, one of the twelve apostles, was one of the ones who was the person who betrayed Jesus. But later Judas regretted his sin and committed suicide. And this morning you learned that after you commit a sin, don't just feel sorry. You have to change directions and repent. Look at verse 3. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 silver coins to the chief priests and elders. Who was this Judas? Well, the Gospels teach us his complete name was Judas Iscariot. He was one of the 12 apostles, the men closest to Jesus during his earthly ministry. But he had a bad attitude from the very beginning. And even in John chapter 12, 1 to 6, it tells us that Judas was a treasurer of the group, but he didn't care about the poor. He wanted money for himself. And so Matthew 27, 3, when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver coins to the chief priests and elders. No one knows exactly why Judas betrayed Jesus. The Bible doesn't tell us. All we're told that Jesus, Judas betrayed Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And so when Judas saw that Jesus was going to be killed, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 silver coins to the chief priests and the elders. Now, 30 pieces of silver was the going rate of a man slave in Jesus' day. So for the price of a man slave, Judas betrayed, sold out the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The clause translated here as, he, he was seized with remorse. He's the central focus of this message. The Greek word here is metamelechias, which means to feel remorseful, to feel regret, 
feel sorry about something. The New Testament word for repentance is the Greek word metanoeo, which means to turn back, to change directions. So Judas did not repent. He was filled with remorse and guilt, but he continued on in the wrong direction. And so the first part of verse 4, I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. Judas realized he had sinned. He was causing um, Jesus to die. In the second part of verse 4, what is that to us? They reply, that's your responsibility. The Jewish religious leaders were worse than Judas. Now that they abused him, they just cast him aside. They couldn't care less what happened to him. And in the first sentence of verse 5, so Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Now the Greek word translated here is through is ripsos, is word that's very strong in Greek. It means to throw or hurl in anger. The Greek word that's translated here as temple is the Greek word neos, which describes that part of the temple where only priests were allowed to enter. So you know how the temple was, right? Only women could, well, just the Jewish women and men, and you saw his small, small, the only way the priest can enter. So this is where he threw the money, to a place where he could not enter. So he just threw the money into this part in the temple. <coughs> so when his attempt to ease his guilty conscience failed, Judas in anger just threw away the blood money. And then the last sentence of verse 5. Then he went away and hanged himself. To compound his sin, instead of turning back to forgiving God, he went off and killed himself. See, there is a tremendous difference between feeling sorry about something and being repentant about something that you've done wrong. At this point, could we have our script reading uh, back on the board again from 2 Corinthians? 2 Corinthians. See, in the letter of 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul is writing to the Corinthian Christians to scold them because of all the sinful things that they're doing. And he got good reports. And so in the second Corinthians, this is second Corinthians, he wrote to tell them how happy he was about how they had changed. So let me read to you the scripture reading again. Second Corinthians 7, 8 to 10. Even if I cause you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I am happy, not because you are made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. Remember that Judas was filled with remorse, which the, the Greek word metamelamethes, which means to feel regretful about something. The word that's translated um, repentance in the second Corinthians twice is metanoeo, which means to turn back, to change directions. Christian repentance is godly sorrow, which always causes, causes a person to turn back to Jesus and to receive his forgiveness and to do what is correct, to correct the wrong. Judas felt sorry for what he had done, but in his pride he couldn't turn back to God. He just went off and instead of repenting, he killed himself. The first point you remember this morning for this message is that every single one of us is guilty for killing Jesus. Can you might say, well, I, I didn't live 2,000 years ago. How can I be guilty of killing Jesus? Well, the Gospels tell us in Romans 3, 23 and other passages that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And what is sin? Anything we say, do, or think, it's contrary to the will of God. The Bible says everyone is a sinner separated from God. So we have a problem. Called sin. Without, because of sin, we can't know God. God has no sin. We can't go to heaven. There is no sin in heaven. And Romans 6 23 says, and the wages or penalty of sin is death. That's why we all die a physical death. But more than that, the Bible teaches that we all face a second spiritual eternal death if we don't get rid of our sin problem while we live here on earth. So we've got a big problem. It's called sin. So what are we going to do about it? Well, people try to be good, try to be religious, try to be kind. But you haven't got rid of the real problem, which is sin. And God knows you can't work your way to heaven, so he gave us the solution, how each person can get to heaven. Jesus lived a sinless life. He had no sin. He didn't have to die a physical death. He didn't have to die a spiritual death. But the Bible says he chose, he allowed himself to be killed. He died on the cross to pay for the sins of every single one of us. 
So when you accept Jesus and become a born again Christian, you're accepting His dying on a cross, dying on a cross for your sins. And that way, you're still guilty, you're still a sinner, but it's forgiven in Christ. Because like, you're guilty of something, but Jesus went to pay the penalty. He paid the fine. He went to jail for you. That's what it means to accept Christ and be born again, to accept His forgiveness. If no one ever sinned, Jesus wouldn't have had to die. He wouldn't have to be on the cross. But because you sin, you sin, you sin, you sin, and I sin. Because we all sin, we caused Jesus to die on the cross. Now, the second thing to keep in mind from our study this morning is, what will your response be to your sin problem? Recognize that the devil's pride is always the block between godly repentance and you. Pride. You can in pride choose to be arrogant and say, I'm not a sinner, I don't care. I don't need God. And you can go on your merry way in the wrong direction and God can't do anything to help you. Or you can be like Judas. And a lot of you are like Judas. You recognize your horrible sins and you feel sorry about them and remorseful, but you continue in the same direction. Say, oh, I feel so bad, I did terrible things. Just keep on and just feel regretful, guilty, and sorry. Or you can make the only response that Jesus wants you to make this morning. You can humble yourself and recognize you are a sinner. Stop. Change directions. Turn to Jesus. Accept his forgiveness. And say, wow, thank you, Jesus. And move on in life. And the next time you fail, because we fail every day, just turn around. Stop. Turn around. Turn back to Jesus. Receive his forgiveness. And move on. And God will keep on using it over and over <coughs> again. If you're not a believer this morning, are there things in your life that need to be corrected? If you never prayed to receive Jesus into your heart, you're not a born-again Christian, Jesus wants you to trust in Him because He died for your sins. But you can't make, you can't force you to become a Christian. It's a choice you made to say, well, I'm a sinner. Jesus, somebody had to pay a price for me, and that's Jesus. All you have to do at the end of the search, you'll have a time of invitation. If you want to accept Jesus, you come forward and share with me, and we'll have a counselor lead you to a room that you can pray and receive Christ in private. But Jesus wants more than for you to have eternal life. He wants you to experience the fullness of the Christian life. And you need to find that when you trust Jesus, you will inside and show that He is truly alive. If you are already a born-again Christian, why does Jesus want you to repent daily? You know, anything God asks of you, you know, it's for your benefit. It's not God's benefit, you know. You serve not to please God. You, yeah, you please God, but it's not for His benefit. You don't give to for God's benefit. Everything God asks of you is for your own benefit. You pray because it helps you. You serve because it helps you. You study the Bible because it helps you. Everything that He asks is for your benefit. Because when you're filled with remorse, remorse, guilt and shame and hate, who's suffering? You're suffering. You cannot experience the fruit of God's Holy Spirit. In Galatians 5, 22 and 23 tells us the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's what Jesus wants for you. The moment you accepted Jesus into your life, you realize all your sins have been forgiven. All the ones you've committed before, all the ones you're going to commit today, this afternoon, and every single one you're going to commit until you die and see Jesus in heaven, they've already been forgiven. It's all forgiven. You don't repent to be forgiven. You're already forgiven in Christ the moment you accepted Jesus. Then why are you going on in the wrong direction? Jesus wants you to truly repent. Just don't feel sorry. Repent. Turn back to Him and receive His forgiveness. If you say you repented and you still feel guilty and ashamed and down about something, it's not God's problem. It's your problem. Because you haven't accepted Him truly into your life in the sense where it says in 1 Corinthians 1, um, excuse me, 1 John 1, 9, John writes, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us for, from all unrighteousness. God wants you to repent, turn to Him, but then you have to accept His forgiveness. If you feel guilty and you praise, I, I repent, no, no, so Jesus, Thank you. You gotta thank him. Say thank you for forgiving me. Get up and go. And you might say the very next hour. 
You can't get the whole God wants to you to use you, but he can't use you. You know, you feel like you're so down on yourself. And I hope this message encourages you to always repent. You know, everybody remembers Judas Iscariot, right? The one who betrayed Jesus. Terrible guy. But do you know, that same morning, there's an apostle close, close, close to Jesus who betrayed Jesus not once, not twice, but three times. Most of you know what? It's Peter. Peter denied Jesus three times that morning because, oh, I don't know that guy. I don't know him. It's because he was worried about his own neck. And yet what happened? Peter repented, crying, sobbing, and turned back to Jesus. And God used him in an amazing way. Who was the leader of the church? Except when Jesus ascended into heaven, it was Peter. God used him in a mighty, mighty way. Roy Regals will be forever remembered as wrong way Regals. Most people forget that the big time boom occurred in the second quarter of the football game. You know, the half time he went to his coach and the coach, I'm too embarrassed, don't put me back in the game. I'm, I just feel you, the team, and all of our fans. The coach told Roy, just go back, it's only half time. Do your best in the second half. He played a tremendous game. California still lost eight to six to Georgia Tech. But he played such a great game. You know, the next season he was elected captain of the football team. At the end of the season, his senior year, he was selected first team All-American. He went on to a very successful, um, he was a high school teacher and a very successful high school football coach. But later on, he started a business because the degree was in agronomy, some soil science. And he started something with farming in California and became very, 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 very wealthy. Many motivational speakers used the example of how Roar Regal's height failed, ran in the wrong direction and stopped corrected himself and did amazing things with his life. As an example to people who have failed, who have fallen down, to get up, don't just continue, don't just get up and move again. We all sin, we all fail, fail many, many, many times. Don't be like a Judas when you make a mistake and continue on in the wrong direction. Be like the raw regals, but more than raw regals, you have to be like the Christian, like Peter, the apostle. Doing such a terrible thing, just and stopping and saying, wow, Lord, and repenting. And God used him in an amazing way. So this morning, make the commitment. Instead of just being sorry, you change directions and accept God's forgiveness for your errors and move on in life so God can use you more and more each day. That's right. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your love and your grace. And how forgiving you are. We thank you for Jesus choosing to suffer and die on the cross for my sins, my terrible sins. And thank you, Lord, that you forgive me. And all I have to do is repent of my sins. And then when I accepted you into my life, all my sins, yesterday to the end of tomorrow, were all forgiven. We thank you, Lord, for every person here that's listening that if they're not a believer, and that they might um, make the decision this morning to trust in you and be born again. And for every believer to not be discouraged or depressed or downtrodden anymore or feel guilt and shame about anything, but to receive your forgiveness truly to repent and to thank you and just be, have the joy and peace that you want them to have so they can go forth to serve you. We thank you, Lord, for this time this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, I want to ask the praise team to come forward and we'll be singing our hymn of invitation. And I was going to speak now there to Mike, but I have to step here. So um, we have an invitation as we're, we're standing in a few moments. If you have a decision to make, especially if you never trusted in Jesus and need to make the decision, if you come forward, share that with me. We have uh, deacons and counselors who are trained. They'll come forward and they'll pray with you. They'll take your home, a separate area in which to pray privately to receive Christ. And if that's your decision, please make it known privately. Some of you are born again believers, but have never followed the Lord in baptism. Where baptism does not save you, except in Jesus what saves you. Baptism is an act of obedience to the Lord. To when you in, in the water, you immerse in the water, say you die to your sins, and you come out of the water, saying, "I was risen into a new life in Christ." And that's your decision to follow the Lord in baptism. Please come forward and share that. Some of you are baptized are believers from another church and wish to unite in fellowship with this church. If that's your decision, please come forward. But in any case, if you have something in your heart, in your mind, just give it to the Lord Jesus. 
He hears, and He wants to bless you. Will you all rise as you sing our hymn of invitation?
Thank you again, Pastor Yen, for another wonderful uh, sermon. And I just like to say, um, how many of you, when they're doing the sermon, when he was doing the sermon, was like, "Are you talking to me? <laughs> Are you talking to me? You know why? You're a sinner. That's why we're all sinners, right?" So thank God that we have such a wonderful God that we can repent and have eternal life with him and celebrate. All right, let's close up in our um, closing song, Oh How I Love Jesus. such a wonderful day and for um, our new um, people that have accepted you as their Lord and Savior. Um, very special day for all of us. We ask your blessings upon our church, upon them, and uh, all uh, who love Jesus as we do. Please continue to uh, bless our church as we move forward with new challenges. Uh, we thank you, Heavenly Father, for Pastor Ian's word today. Um, we all sin and uh, we all transgress. The difference is that we as Christians return to God and I have this image Heavenly Father of you and uh, your warm embrace of all of us as your sons and daughters. 
and by accepting you as our Lord and Savior, turning to you during our times of need, we, we know that you are there for us. And from that process, we can repent and have salvation. So thank you for that gift, Heavenly Father. We ask that you bless our church, uh, our families, and our loved ones, and continue to um, bless uh, us as we move forward. Take us home safely to our respective destinations today and continue to have our church be one that loves you and uh, uh, be a people that love all those, uh, our neighbors and friends. These things we ask, Heavenly Father, in the precious and holy name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.